Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we have a real treat for you. We're gonna be tearing down and inspecting a TH-475. So this is the beefier brother to the TH-400. Uh, these were produced from 71 up through, I think, 89 or 1990, and were installed in very heavy duty vehicles like motorhomes, box trucks, um, you know, uh, very specialized commercial or quasi-commercial type applications. And their primary claim to fame is the straight cut gear sets that were installed in these. And it makes them highly sought after by uh, hot rodders, um, you know, folks doing heavy duty towing, working, hauling, as well as, um, you know, really hardcore off-road stuff, you know, rock crawling and um, mud bogging and things of that nature. So. Uh, we're going to go through it. I'm not going to spend a ton of time boiling the ocean with every single thing in terms of, you know, um, points of inspection, differences and all that stuff. Uh, we'll do deep dive topical videos to concentrate on, you know, one particular aspect or part or, you know, component within the transmission. But um, suffice to say, everything that I will say about the TH-475 will also apply to the TH-400. So uh, let's get right into it. Okay, so there's two ways primarily to distinguish a 475 from a regular TH400. Uh, one is the presence of a drum brake assembly here for the parking, and the other is the ID tag, and we'll get into some detail when uh, we get to that point, but the ID tag is on the passenger side over in the middle of the case there. Um, so we got this whole core here, and it's, it's just a core, it's, it's referred to as a cutaway. Uh, what they did is they literally cut it out of the vehicle it was in. I think this came from a mid-80s motorhome. And the only bolts they actually took out were the um, bell housing to engine block bolts. So I've been soaking these bolts in croil. I don't know how long that this thing's been sitting wherever it was sitting before I got to it. But um, suffice to say, you want to make sure you soak these kind of bolts so that you can um, get them off without breaking or stripping anything out. Uh, the other thing you can do is tap on it like this with like a, a small hammer. And I've been doing that throughout the week. So you just, you just go like this, tap on the bolt head to kind of help break the corrosion bond that might exist in there. So three eighths here um, for the U-joint bolts. So you got one here and then you got a strap on the bottom and then these are 11 sixteenths. Uh, I admit I've never been into a TH-475 before. So this will kind of be like a new experience for me so if you've never seen one then we'll be discovering this together so all right they came right out and then now the uh, bolt on yoke down here I believe is either 20 millimeters or 7 eighths or something like that so I have a few different sockets and whichever one works that's what we'll go with so these are 11 sixteenths Change my mode there. All right, let me see if I can get this uh, yoke out. The yoke bolt, rather. All right, that's too big. Uh, that was 21 millimeter. That's also too big. Okay, let me try three quarters. Yeah, looks like three quarters is going to be the correct size. So who knows, this thing may fight me or it may cooperate. Like I said, I've never really been inside or worked on one of these ever.
All right, looks like we're just gonna end up taking the entire back half of this thing off. So, here's the yoke. And you'd obviously want to inspect the ceiling surfaces. You may need to acquire a new yoke if this is gonna go back together. Okay, so we have bolts and nuts, and like I said, I've, I've never messed with these before. Um, but all this does is hold that flange with the yoke on, and so I just needed to put uh, you know, a breaker bar or something, or a wrench on the other side while I zip these out. I'll do that later. One thing you wanna check for too, in fact, let me bring it back real quick. One thing you wanna check for as well is any discoloration along the journal surface here where the bushings go. And you're really looking for anything that actually looks like bushing material in terms of the color. So if you see anything like bronze or, um, you know, Babbitt looking in terms of uh, the color, it's not the usual steel color like this, that would indicate uh, the presence of electrolysis. And that's like an electrochemical transfer material from uh, the bushing or whatever, um, you know, the source material is to uh, the destination piece. So in this case, it would be, um, you know, the yoke. And that occurs when um, the vehicle's electrical system is grounding itself on the drive line. So if you see that, then you know you have some electrical issues that you'll need to sort out before you put the transmission back in the vehicle. Okay, so here's the four bolts. They are gonna be 15 millimeter. And then we got two little nuts here on this mounting bracket that's holding the uh, what appears to be the parking brake cable or what's left of it. Okay, these are either 3 8 or 13 millimeter. So let me get a socket that works or a wrench and then we'll continue. Okay, it turns out they're 7 sixteenths. Um, 12 millimeter should work as well. Okay, it looks like there's a nut and bolt combo. I probably should have looked at that before I decided to go at it. This thing's filthy. It's been sitting in a yard somewhere for God knows how long, decades, you know, centuries. Who knows? Okay, so they're they're just kind of more or less held in place. Kind of like a, I guess a, a quasi carriage bolt and nut setup. All right, there we go. Okay, so we have transmission free of the parking brake assembly. So um, this mounting bracket right here is held on by a couple of extension housing nuts. And then we have 
the parking brake assembly, or at least the rest of it. This thing's like a thousand years old. Okay, 916 on the extension housing. See if I can get them off of the 3 8 If not, we'll go to the half inch. Either this is the wrong size or they're just really cruddy. somehow I gotta get clearance because the bend here is interfering with my ability to get to that nut. Yep. Still can't get on it. Parts are going to be reused. I mean, you know, the stuff that's going to come off here, the peripherals, brackets, and all this other junk. So, not too worried about beating them up a little bit. All right, let me uh, clean up the bench a little bit, get this wood out of the way, and then we'll proceed with the tear down. All right, let's uh, see if we can get this extension housing off. So we got two more bolts, 15 millimeters each. I should say nuts. They're all off, so let's see if we can get that housing out of the way. I might actually have to bring the wood back. Uh, maybe not. Be able to get away without it.
I'm just be real careful. You'll notice there's rubber spacers. The washer is here and behind the nut. They're not rubber, I guess they're steel. They look rubber for a second. Okay. So let's take a look at the extension housing real quick. So you notice that there is a roller bearing in behind the seal. And then there's another roller bearing deeper on the inboard side. So you got two roller bearings. Okay, so um, if you're going to go back with this uh, and, and your you know, transmission looks like this coming into it, you want to replace these bearings. I mean, I would never reuse these in an actual rebuild. This is a core, so um, it's going to go get slapped back together and put back in my core's yard. So I'm not going to be, uh, in fact, I'm going to just leave that seal in there for waterproofing. And I'm just going to leave this together like this. But um, you know, regular TH400s don't have these... Uh, these roller bearings all right and then you got kind of an involved uh, cross member here you got you know multiple points of attachment you always want to check your motor mounts or excuse me your trans mount um, <laughs> I'm always calling this thing a motor mount uh, if your motor mount and um, I did that on purpose if your mount here is cracked or worn and you go back with it um, it could affect uh, vibrations in the rear of the case or cause vibrations, I should say, and actually damage the transmission. So you want to be sure that you replace that rear transmission mount. All right, so we can see right off the bat there is a fair amount of rust on this thing. Okay. Um, let me reposition the camera so you can get a little bit better view. Okay, a lot of rust. That could be for any number of reasons. Like I said, this thing's been sitting. Who knows for how long and who knows where it's been. Um, check your splines. These are 32 spline outputs. Uh, you very rarely see problems with these. But, you know, you want to make sure that your output shaft is good to go. So, you know, they're exposed. Check them out. And then same here, check your uh, studs, make sure the threads are okay, that you didn't strip anything out um, during the course of taking the extension housing off and whatnot. All right, speedometer cable bracket is going to be 10 millimeter. Now you're just going to have to wiggle it free. And this one's loose, so that helps. What I'm doing is I'm prying on the back side of the Speedo gear itself against the case. There it goes. That was a lot more complicated than it needed to be. But, I mean, you can get these housings new, obviously, but, uh, you know, if you can avoid damaging, it just needs to be cleaned up and, it, you know, should be fine. All right, this is gonna be your detent solenoid case connector. Um, some of these connectors had one tab, some had two. It just depends on what year, make, and variant you're working with. In uh, 65 through early 67 on Buick's Oldsmobiles, uh, uh, Rolls-Royce and Cadillacs, they had what's called a variable pitch converter or switch pitch. So those um, particular units had a two-prong connector. Um, they were, it was kind of an innovative design, um, very interesting, and how they worked was at lower speeds to acceleration, you would have a higher stall 
uh, the converter would be set to uh, you know give you a higher stall speed and then once you got to cruising your speed at stall would then drop for more fuel economy or better fuel economy I should say and so um, you know it's kind of like the best of both worlds in a way now uh, that design went out in late 1967. They stopped producing those. And as far as I know, it was only um, submodels or models within those four makes and nothing else. So this obviously has just a single prong for the D10 solenoid. So if you have a problem um, in the D10 system, the first thing you want to do is check this wire. Okay, it can get cut, frayed, it can short out. And you know, obviously that will render your solenoid inoperable and you'll have issues with downshifting and um, you, know, you may have uh, no upshift or very late uh, harsh upshifts or other similar drivability symptoms. You know, it could be any number of things, but um, the, D20, the D10 system uh, is a source of a lot of different drivability problems. Just like the modulator is, just like the governor is, I mean, they're kind of the unholy trinity of you know, part throttle drivability problems that can, you know, plague your transmission. Um, you can throw the valve body in the mix, no upshift, no downshift, uh, late, early, you know, whatever the case may be. So then you have the four horsemen of the apocalypse. All right, come back around for your selector arm bracket. You got your 15 millimeter nut. Okay, these selector shafts are the same as any, you know, um, TH350, any TH400, no difference. Uh, no difference in terms of the mechanical linkage. So um, this is, uh, I don't know, maybe 5 sixteenths or something. I'm not really sure, to be honest. Um, let me see if I can find a socket for that real quick. So five sixteenths. All right, our dipstick tube. Okay, this thing's actually full of fluids, so I'm probably gonna pause to drain it before we take the pan off. We'll flip it around. And as you can see, some fluids belching out. So here is the other and much more accurate and surefire way of determining exactly what kind of transmission you have. And that is the ID tag. Um, unfortunately, this one kind of got messed up, but you can clearly see uh, the letters F and I. Let me zero in. Okay, now, well, I, maybe I lied. I don't know how clear it is actually on camera, but uh, you have an F here and an I here. So uh, I will post in the description a link to all of the TH400, TH375, and TH475 identification codes along with their year and application so that you have that at the ready. Uh, all that information comes directly from Ron Sessions um, rebuilding the uh, Turbo Hydromatic 400 book. Uh, if there is one book you can buy one manual or whatever for these things uh, that would be it it is pretty much all encompassing end to end tells you everything you need to know about the th400 and he has a similar book for the th350 uh, atsg manuals are also fine and I, I don't know if atra makes one for this unit or not but um i have the atsg manual and i have ron sessions book and that that should cover the bases but anyway um this is how you identify what unit you're working with and where it came from so there's going to be a means to identify the year as well as the make and submodel or model. All right, vacuum modulator. Maybe half inch. 
Okay, early modulators looked um, you know, almost like a, a, a can. They were black in color. They were not adjustable. I mean, technically they were, but uh, the factory spot welded the adjuster screw uh, in place so that you couldn't adjust it. Um, I guess they didn't want their, you know, end users and owners messing with the modulator system for whatever reason. So there's three primary concerns that can happen to the modulator that'll cause all kinds of problems depending upon what they are. Um, the modulator can fail internally where the diaphragm gets porphyrated and you'll know if that happens when you have a whole bunch of like um, white smoke coming out of the tailpipe and transmission fluid being burnt with uh, gasoline in the, uh, you know, in the engine getting sucked in uh, via the vacuum line that you know, connects to here. Um, you can also have modulator valve itself hanging up. So uh, if it's kind of dragging on the way out, you maybe want to polish the bore a little bit or, you know, inspect the valve real carefully and, you know, sand it down with 800 or 1,000 grit sandpaper. Okay, again, your modulation system primarily governs your part throttle shifting, so that's 90% of your driving um, if you're driving on the street. So you want to make sure that the modulator valve and the bore there is in good shape. Okay, in most cases you won't have an issue, but every once in a while you might need to polish it up and, and polish the bore with like a bench buddy or something. Okay, the third concern is when the modulator and or the uh, lines, they get um, impregnated with water. And if you live in a real cold weather environment, that water will freeze overnight. And if you go to start the vehicle up and try to drive it, line pressures inside the transmission will shoot through the roof. I mean, you might see something like four, five, six, seven hundred PSI, and normal operating pressures is in the neighborhood of 170, 175 max. Okay, um, 200 PSI in these things is is considered borderline too high. Um, you know, like if you're running one of those real super high strength um, aftermarket pressure regulator springs in the pump because maybe you're drag racing or doing something else, um, you want to be real careful about how much pressure is being, um, you know, produced inside the case. And you also want to be mindful of converter ballooning in those situations. So you'll need to put a restrictor on the back of the pump where the converter charges so that you don't have the converter violently um, you know, being pushed into the flex plate and consequently the crank, because if that happens and it happens enough, you'll, you know, really mess up your uh, main thrust bearing inside the engine. So those are the main concerns, both with uh, the modulator and then to some extent, I guess I covered a little bit about the pump. But other than that, um, you know, I'll get a, a, another video on the channel that dives deep into the modulator system, how to diagnose it and all that good stuff. But for now, let me get this fluid out of here because uh, I don't want, you know, an entire lake of transmission fluid. I mean, this, these have a deep pan, so there's a lot of capacity. And then we'll resume with the teardown. Okay, now we'll resume with the governor. So half inch bolts for the cover. Okay, inspect your gear. <clears throat> My advice, if you're rebuilding the unit, just replace the gear. Uh, they're not that expensive. Main thing you wanna be concerned about is the movement of this valve. So when you actuate the weights like this, you wanna see that valve inside move nice and free. It's no different than a THV50 or 700R4 governor. Um, if that's not happening, then use a roll pin punch, take off the gear, take out that little roll pin, um, and then you know, you're gonna have to get up in there and you have to wedge the valve out. Once you do that, go over the valve, chuck it up in a drill or something, and you know, do some WD-40 with 1,000 grit sandpaper, and then polish the bore itself with a bench buddy, and that should make it good to go. Um, you know, these TH-400 governors are not directly interchangeable with the TH-350 700R4. Uh, the gears themselves, uh, the spiral pattern is in the opposite direction of a TH-350 or 700, so uh, you know, they're not you know, really... Um, readily swappable without a lot of modifications so and it's usually not worth your time i mean you can get governor um, modification kits and repair kits you can replace the gear you can uh, polish the bore and deal with the valve so 
most common problem with governors, um, you know, in terms of drivability symptoms is no upshift. So if you have no upshift whatsoever, uh, it's almost always governor. Check the, uh, the teeth and the gear. They usually get stripped out, especially, you know, if they're sitting a while and then they're put back in the service. Um, the other thing you want to be, uh, you know, watchful for is a worn out governor bore. So eyeball that real close. If uh, you have the checking tool that uh, I think Sonics makes, um, you can put that right in there and put compressed air into the checking tool and listen for hissing coming out of the perimeter, you know, the bore itself. So if you see that or if for, you know, you're taking one in for somebody and they talk about all kind of drivability problems and inconsistent shifting and they've tried everything under the sun, you know, pay real close attention to this bore. So you may have to uh, either find another case or if you have the reamer, you can ream this out and install a repair sleeve and that will restore the bore to, you know, perfect condition and you can, you know, run the governor no problem. Okay, um, got your O-ring here for your modulator. Don't forget to put the new one on when you go back with it. And then we talked about the tags. So, uh, for the pump, just like all these other transmissions that, uh, you know, don't involve having an input shaft that just comes out. Okay, you wanna check end play. Okay, this has a fair amount of in play, so uh, depending upon what you're trying to do, you may want to tighten it up or you may want to leave it on the looser side of spec. It depends, but um, by doing this, it'll give you an idea of what the unit was like when it came in. All right, I'm going to flip it over, reposition the camera, then we'll go ahead and take everything off on the other side, and then we'll move back to the case and take everything out of there and then um, look at all the sub-assemblies. Okay, these are kind of heavy units, so you, you need to be careful. Um, just make sure your bench is sturdy. So half inch in all these bolts. Hey, you see this is filthy. It's been sitting for a while. Looks like somebody used a little bit of RTV on, on the pan gasket. You can see some of it on the other side of the bolts. Never use RTV unless the factory specifically calls for it for whatever reason. And to my knowledge, that is not the case with any GM transmission. All right, so if you have a situation where you might have some RTV holding the pan fast to the case, go in with a flat blade screwdriver and then make sure that the uh, tip of the blade is smooth like this. You don't want anything that's, um, you know, got ridges in it. <clears throat> and then go right at a bolt hole location. Okay, don't stick the blade out here in the middle of the two bolts. Go right on top of the bolt. And to the extent you can, try to be on the pan side of the gasket. I was expecting a little more resistance than that, but you know, it came right off. Hey, and don't use a cork gasket. I mean, those things tend to leak like sieves. They're worthless. Just use either a composite gasket or, you know, if maybe you come with a uh, high performance pan, maybe it has a, uh, you know, one of those more modern type um, hard rubber gaskets that are reusable. I don't know of any for the TH400, but, um, you know, I'm just kind of speculating. But just generally speaking, you don't want to deal with uh, RTV anywhere. Okay, filter bolts, half inch. Very early units had a completely different kind of filter. And uh, that filter had like a, uh, you know, some sort of orifice bleeder valve on it. It was real thick. And I wanna say uh, those were installed from 64 to either 60, late 65 or 66. And they're, you know, they have a different pan. 
And the pans usually have, uh, you know, uh, like little indentations or, um, I don't know, like they're sometimes referred to as heel prints. Uh, most TH400s have two, some have three. Um, I'll annotate uh, specifically what the two versus three mean, but it has to do with vintage. Um, the earlier pans uh, were formed uh, in line with the filters, which these are the flat style, but uh, the early ones were much thicker, okay? So, you, you know, the pan and the filter combos were not interchangeable um, between, you know, each other. Like, you couldn't stick a later pan on our, or, you know, use it with an early filter and vice versa, okay? 1964 was the first year of the TH400, and it was had what's called a single-range valve body. Those valve bodies were standalone year for the 64 um, model year only. They are not interchangeable with any other year. So... Unlike these valve bodies and these rooster combs that have, um, you know, detents for park, reverse, neutral, drive, two, and one, the 64 units had all of those detents except for two. They did not have a, a detent or a, you know, a, um, a circuit for manual second. Okay, so here's your pickup tube. It has an O-ring. It's good practice to have two O-rings on this tube when you go back with it. All right, um, let me go get my pry bar. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take off the valve body bolts. First, I'm gonna take off the um, detent solenoid. These are three eighths. And then everything else is gonna be more or less half inch, okay? So half inch on your um, low reverse piston and piston housing cover. Three eighths here for the detent solenoid and then half inch for everything else. Uh, half inch for your parking pole guide. Okay, note the way that the little retainer spring is orientated. Okay, it's just like that. And it hooks into the little boss right here. I'm gonna just stick everything in there. All right, let me get the detent solenoid out of the way. You always wanna replace these solenoids. Okay, your detent system can be the source of a lot of drivability symptoms and issues, um, particularly downshifting. Uh, you may have late downshifts or, you know, you may have no downshifts at all. Uh, you know, they may be erratic. There may be a lot of inconsistency with respect to how the, you know, how the vehicle's behaving if there's a problem in the detent system. So you have your detent solenoid, uh, obviously your case connector, and then you have your detent and detent regulator valves in the valve body. And that's basically the detent system in a nutshell. So again, same deal, I'll do a, a maybe a topical video that's dedicated to the detent system so that you have a better understanding of how it works. And you know, we'll show you how to troubleshoot and diagnose issues with that system. Okay, those are 716s, sorry. Seven sixteenths, seven sixteenths, seven sixteenths. So everything else is like that. Okay, if you're taking it off like I am because of the sake of the camera, just like hold it just like you see me doing here so uh, you don't take a risk in bending the uh, feed lines to the governor.
take your pry bar, kind of just carefully wedge it between the lines in the case and pull back toward you. And that'll free the two lines from the case. So we have our 2-3 accumulator piston. Uh, these plastic pistons like to break. Okay, this is the second design piston, and it's mated with, uh, in conjunction to, a second design intermediate servo. So earlier uh, model units, the servo and the 2-3 accumulator piston were a matched pair, uh, service pack, if you will. So you cannot interchange early versus late but you can go back and forth as long as you use either a late design 2-3 uh, accumulator piston with a late design servo and you know early design piston with early design servo. Uh, the early design uh, pistons had no you know little <clears throat> ridges like this. This has uh, you know three little bumps there and uh, the earlier design pistons had um, ridges just like you know kind of what you see here on the accumulator piston so that's the reason why they don't directly interchange you know between each other uh, as a match service pack they will go back and forth you always want to replace these plastic pistons uh, they are no good they will crack and break on you it's pretty much a guarantee here's your spacer plate and your manual valve Just take that out get it out of the way Okay, inspect those governor feed tubes. If they get clogged, you'll have problems shifting. And then, looks like this thing may have overheated a little bit. Gas gets kind of bonded to the to the casting here. Uh, no check balls in the valve body. So for the case, you're gonna have your, looks like uh, one, two, three, four, five, this has six check balls. Um, you absolutely have to have the, um, intermediate check ball and you absolutely have to have the low reverse check ball here in the bathtub. The rest you can omit or delete depending upon what you're doing and what kind of setup you're running but those two check balls have to be in the case. Okay you got your governor uh, filter screen right here don't forget about that when you go back with it and you can reuse these as long as they're not torn just you know wash them out with brake cleaner. So half inch All right, let's see what we got. So we have our 1-2 accumulator piston, and then inside here we have our low reverse servo piston. So we got the return spring for the servo, and you got your return spring for your 1-2 accumulator. It's not recommended that you delete the 1-2 accumulators in these uh, transmissions, TH400, this one, or the 375. Reason being is that um, the uh, accumulator kind of acts as a timing agent for when the intermediate clutch fully applies relative to when the intermediate sprag is holding so you know it has a chance to grab and hold um, if the clutch pack applies before the sprag has had a chance to hold in other words it's in the process of holding um, it'll stress that sprag and after a while it'll break so you, you know it's recommended that you keep the one two active and then you do other things to tune your one two shift based on what you're trying to do okay so here's your, oops, here's your band servo and your spring. And then always make sure you replace these Teflon sealing rings, um, both of them, uh, this one and this one, on your accumulator piston. Uh, I think there's some guidance uh, somewhere in some manual, maybe the ATSG, maybe another one, I don't know. But I remember reading that uh, they'll tell you that if you don't have any obvious signs of damage to these sealing rings, that you can leave them alone. Uh, that's bad advice. Okay, they can get worn just like any other. And you know, if you start slipping and uh, you know, in your one-two shift, when you go back with it because you didn't replace these sealing rings here, then you know that's that's going to obviously damage your uh, your intermediate clutches. So always replace them. Don't ever reuse them.
All right, so we have our check balls. Um, we have our intermediate feed bolt to the center support. So that's gonna be a 3 8 12 point. And even those were different in the very early units. They used traditional hex bolt design. And then I wanna say in either 89 or 90, they actually changed the center support and the length of this bolt. Um, which was carried forward into the early 4L80Es. The uh, new bolt is, I want to say, about a quarter or three-eighths of an inch longer. So here's a feed bolt. Okay, this one got messed up a little bit. It's my bad. So feed bolts can be found anywhere. Um, you know, when I go back together with this one, I'll just put another one in it. Okay, for your for your parking linkage, you have your rooster comb to selector shaft nut. Okay, it's going to be nine sixteenths. And then you have your finish nail. So the finish nail actually will come out when you take the pump out. So when you go back together with this thing, you wanna make sure that you install the finish nail, the retainer for the selector shaft um, before you put the pump in. Because otherwise you'll never get that in there. All right, I'm gonna clean off the bench a little bit, then we'll take the pump out and then I'm gonna just evacuate the whole case and then we'll go through the sub assemblies one by one. All right, um, one thing before I get to the pump, uh, you want to make sure that you sand the worm tracks. You know, just take a Dura block and some 400 sandpaper and, you know, um, just sand it down completely. Uh, spend a few minutes on it, maybe like five minutes. Uh, make sure that the entire surface here is perfectly flat. Uh, that'll help prevent any kind of cross leaps when you go back together with it and ensure that everything's good to go in that respect. So. Um, you can take the case connector out whenever. Um, I'm just leave it in for now. So there are two different uh, configurations when it comes to bolt, uh, bolt patterns. There are eight bolts and there were six bolts uh, when it comes to pump the case. So here we have six bolts, two, four, and six. Uh, 64 to 72, there are eight bolts. Uh, so if you have a six bolt pump body, uh, you can install that on an eight bolt case and vice versa, it's no big deal. Uh, the only other thing you have to keep in mind is uh, fixed pitch must never be mixed or interchanged with variable pitch uh, in terms of overall configuration. So any fixed pitch pump with a converter that takes a single stall will interchange as an assembly, but um, you cannot mix pump assemblies for fixed pitch with converters and variable, with variable pitch and vice versa. Half inch on the bolts. Okay, so to get this pump out, you're gonna need a slide hammer. You have two threaded locations right here on each side. So just thread the slide hammer uh, in and then just wrap it out and, and that's basically it. So let me go get a slide hammer and then we'll resume.
don't know exactly what the thread pitch is offhand, I'll annotate the video with it, but I'm just using two random bolts that I have laying around. I got our pump. So we got a selective spacer, and then of course we have our ceiling rings. Uh, these look like the scarf cut variety. So if you wanted to, for and I do this for all my high performance stuff, you can use the uh, 480E center support one piece Teflon ceiling rings. Uh, as long as you have the sizing tool or a suitable hose clamp, you can run those. I like those a little bit better than the scarf cut or the, you know, the iron rings, but any one of those uh, types of rings will work in a more or less factory application and even for a mild performance. But if you wanted to do something, uh, you know, a little bit more high performance or you know, a little more heavy duty, I generally like to run the one piece ceiling rings. But if you built these before and you know, you know, you had like a full race application or something like street strip or whatever, high horsepower and you use the, the uh, scarf cut rings with no issues, I mean, you know, those are fine too. So it's not anything mandatory or even where I'd say, yeah, you have to do this or it's strongly advised. It's really kind of builder's preference in my opinion. Okay, so there's your finish nail. And the nut. And sometimes the, uh, the selector shaft will hang up. And if it does, just tap it out. Show you what I'm talking about here. And it'll come right out. You're not going to damage the bore. I mean, the selector seal itself will seal off the bolt, the bore, regardless. One thing you want to do is inspect the shaft. Okay. Make sure that uh, there's no obvious scoring or, um, you know, you know, any kind of like uh, deep scratches that could potentially cut the seal. Because you're going to install the seal first and you're going to install the shaft. All right, I'm gonna take the pump apart later in the video when I go through the sub-assemblies. I just wanna get everything else out of the case first. Okay, so forward drum, direct drum, and you have your intermediate band. And I have performance bands for TH400s, you can run if you wanted to. And you have your intermediate clutch. And for all of these TH400s, when it comes to the intermediate clutch, I would strongly recommend that you upgrade the, uh, the uh, intermediate clutch snap ring to you know, a heavy, heavier duty variant. There we go. All right, these are very flimsy. Any kind of high performance application, you run the risk of them breaking, so you don't want that. Okay, 
Hey, you got your three frictions and your three steels and your pressure plate or apply plate. A little bit of slippage here, nothing overly concerning, just, you know, a couple signs of, uh, of heat build up there. And then you got some burn marks there on the uh, frictions themselves on the back side. Let's take a look at the front side. Same deal. So a little bit of slipping. It's a very heavy duty unit, so, you know, having, uh, having slip marks, you know, occasionally is normal. Okay, so you have your center support snap ring. Okay, another thing you want to be wary of, and I'll, I'll get into this a little bit more when we actually take the pump apart, but you want to be make, you want to be wary of high line pressure inside the transmission. So uh, one of the you know kind of side effects to high line pressure is going to be a case lug blowout at the snap ring for the intermediates. So you can run a case saver in there to you know kind of mitigate the risk. Uh, especially if you're doing something real high stall, high RPM racing, street strip, or anything like that. Um, it's good practice. All right, let's get the gear train out. Hey, all I'm doing is just pressing a little bit on the uh, output shaft and then pulling everything forward. So I want to grab it by the center support and continue to feed it back into the uh, mouth of the case. And in this way you can pull it out in one unified assembly. All right, now you got your low reverse band. And then for later model units, you have what's called an anti-fretting ring. Okay, uh, earlier units, and I'll annotate with the exact year that they um, started to install these. Uh, earlier units did not have them, and what was happening is the center support was wearing the case. Now, when a fretting ring is installed, you have to use a later model uh, center support because the lugs are thicker in the early models, and they're not interchangeable unless you machine uh, the early style center support. Now with that said, if you are working on a very early TH400 that did not have the fretting ring installed and you have the thicker center support, um, you can either retro a later center support into that case with the fretting ring, that's recommended. Uh, you can also machine your pre-existing center support, the original one that came out of there, uh, so that you can install the fretting ring and the center support and everything will be good to go and it'll all, you know, bolt back up. Because otherwise you won't be able to get your um, center support snap ring in and everything else will obviously be, um, you know, displaced if you try to install that uh, earlier center support and the fretting ring at the same time. All right, last thing that's going to be in the case is going to be the selective um, three-tab steel washer. So uh, if you watched any of my other TH400 or 4LED videos, I never reinstall that thing. Um, I delete both it and the, um, and the four-tab Babbitt washer that goes on the back of the uh, ring gear for the output shaft. And I replace that with a uh, roller bearing from a TH350 pump. So, uh, not roller bearing, Torrington bearing, and um, some shims. And basically, I set my end play. I like between six and 12 thousandths for the rear, and for the front, I'll try to shoot for roughly double that so that there's no interference. So, if I have six thousandths in the rear, then I'll have 12 thousandths end play in the front, and so forth. All right, uh, let me get this case out of the way. Um, you know, the only other things I'll mention as far as, you know, points of inspection with the case itself, um, just check your lugs, make sure everything's good. Same with the band anchors, make sure they're not loose or coming out or whatever. 
um, check everywhere else um, with respect to your case bolt hole location. So, you know, all your uh, pump the case, your valve body, and um, anywhere else, you know, you want to make sure that if you need to do a helicoil repair, you know about it now where the case is like this versus, you know, going back with it and you have to re-evacuate the case to get um, a helicoil repair done. Let me grab the uh, selector seal. All right, I'm gonna wash this case up. I'm not gonna sand it. Like I said, this is a core. It's gonna go back, you know, assembled as you see it, and get put back in the yard. I may reserve this for a, uh, you know, project in the future, something like a maybe a real late '60s or '70s square body uh, truck, something like a, you know, a C, a C10 or uh, maybe a K5 Blazer or something like that. Something that I'm not gonna take on road trips, but uh, maybe an off-road vehicle. This would be a great platform for that. All right, let me get it out of the way, and then we will uh, resume with the sub-assemblies. All right, let's take a closer look at everything, starting with the gear train. So we'll pull off the center support. And with this, you just kind of want to turn it counterclockwise, and then just carefully take it off. Okay, this is going to be your your bottom race for your bearing there for uh, center support to sun gear thrust. And then you have a little washer down there. Let me get that out of there. This is a Babbitt style washer, so. Can be a little stubborn sometimes. You got your planetaries, your sun gear, and your sun gear shaft. Okay, so there's your bearing, the other two uh, pieces. So center support, your reaction carrier, aka front planet, with your low roller clutch. Um, I never reuse these, you should always replace them on overhaul. Uh, typically they are worn, and that's true at TH400s and 4L80Es. Okay, there's a couple different variations of these. Um, there are those that have this little spacer, it's like a riser, um, to where you have the uh, low roller clutch that does not have legs on it. And then you have the other variety where it has legs and, you know, this uh, spacer isn't in there. So, um, what I want to do for this video is I will put a document that has all of the different variations of parts and components, uh, gear train, pumps, um, valve bodies, you know, drums, pistons, all that good stuff. Because it's, I mean, I could have this video be six hours long if I went over all of it. So, um, you know, just know that uh, there is a couple different variations of these planets. And you want to make sure you have the right planet matched with the... Uh, right kind of low roller clutch assembly okay so there's the straight cut planetary gear sets so like all of your planets you're going to check them you want to make sure there's no side play um, if there is it's not the end of the world these can be rebuilt the main thing is you want to make sure that these gears themselves aren't chipped you know, they're actually in good shape. They have little indexing notches cut into them that's normal from the factory. So if you see that, like, don't panic. Okay, check your vertical play. Now I'm just taking a closer look. You want to make sure that uh, on each side of the face of the tooth is not worn. And you never want to clean these with brake cleaner and spray them down with, uh, you know, um, uh, compressed air because that actually ruins the little needle bearings inside, uh, you know, inside the pinions. So just be mindful of that. And then, yeah, I guess 
the surface itself. You want to make sure that the surface for the band is not heavily scored. It's not overly warped. It's not completely burnt. If it is, you can turn these. You know, you just machine it. And then you adjust your uh, servo travel accordingly. Okay, there's a lot of latitude that you have, margin for error, when it comes to pin travel. Um, I think I have a, a segment on this on the channel. If I don't, I'll put one. But suffice to say, don't get overly concerned or stressed about it. It's it not at this point. All right, uh, center support. So if you wanted to dual feed this thing, um, and I say dual feed, I'm talking about the direct clutch. You're going to take off this uh, second from the top ring and leave it off. And then when we get to the direct drum, you're going to leave the seal on the drum that, you know, goes there, the lip seal. In the center of the drum, you're going to leave that out. Then you're going to plug the high reverse feed port on the case. And that is the port immediately to the right of the intermediate feed bolt. Okay, the feed bolt that goes in the center support. So that's dual feeding. Um, with respect to the applied piston for the intermediate, there was three different variations. They had um, an aluminum piston that took a return spring assembly that had 12 springs. I think those went into some of the Cadillacs and other real big, um, big inch engines, you know, big blocks, etc. Uh, then there was the um, aluminum piston that took three springs. And then you have this variety that's stamped steel that uses a plastic retainer. And that obviously takes um, three springs. I don't know, I guess I shouldn't say obviously. I mean, it's, you know, got to take this off first. Now it's obvious. So I'm not a fan of these, uh, you know, this particular variant. Whenever I see them, I swap them for like a, an aluminum setup. But uh, in a stock application, they're fine. Um, if you're going to reuse this, just make sure that it's not cracked, you know, broken in any way. Make sure it's not overly hard either. And then... The piston itself, I mean, you know, same deal. Just make sure it's not obviously damaged or disfigured. Okay, check your sealing surface. All right, you don't want to have a sealing surface that's scored up. Okay, just make sure that in here, um, you know, you don't have that issue. Uh, some earlier center supports and some pistons are not compatible because they lack the bleeder ball or the little um, check valve in this location. And you wanna make sure that you have center support and um, uh, intermediate apply piston pairing that is compatible. So you always wanna be careful of that if you're swapping parts. And I'll add a with a little bit more um, detail, but just it's something you wanna keep in mind when you're working with the uh, center support and the intermediate clutch when it comes to apply pistons. Um, bushing replace it and oh yeah make sure the outer race make sure it's nice and smooth okay same with the journal surface here okay make sure that's nice and smooth no scoring no damage of any kind nature or sort all right I think now I'm done all right sun gear shaft there was an early sun gear shaft and a late sun gear shaft Okay, and there was an early and a late sun gear. Um, the interchange rule with these is the uh, they will install as a service pack. Okay, and when you put it back together, you want to make sure that your hole here and your hole here are lined up. Um, they will install as a service pack. Uh, I believe the late sun gear will interchange back to the uh, earlier sun gear shaft, but the earlier sun gear shaft will not prospectively install, but I'll double check that and I'll annotate if I need to correct it. Or I'll annotate regardless so that you're not left wondering. <clears throat> Voice is a little forced today. So you have your little thrust washer. It's a four tab washer. Um, all TH400s had the four tab. Later four LADEs took a two tab. All right. Then you have your um, intermediate shaft here. You want to make sure your splines are in good shape, that they're not worn. Same with the journal surfaces. It's very common when you install new bushings um, to have this kind of problem. And I'll just simulate. Okay, I'm just pretending that this is getting stuck here. It's not going on. Um, that's no big deal. It's very common. All you do is you just take some sandpaper. I used to do uh, 
400. Now I use 600 and then I'll hollow it out. Uh, you can use some emery cloth and then I'll finish up once I have it on there with 800 to 1000 grit. Okay. You can also take a small brake hone, a very small one, and hone out your bushings to fit as well. I almost prefer that anymore because I like bushings that are too uh, thick so I can hone them to fit just right. And, you know, I'll do a, a video on actually checking bushing clearance because that is important. Um, and I'll show you how to do that. Again, it will be a topical video for another day. All right, let's separate everything here. You have your um, rear ring gear, your output shaft, and then your snap ring. The snap ring kind of holds all this stuff together. And let's see what I got here handy. Okay, this snap ring is kind of tough. And if you break it, don't worry about it. I mean, they're everywhere and they're all the same. Um, TH400 had, had a few different output shafts. So depending upon whether you're working on, a, you know, with a two wheel drive or a four by four is gonna, you know, determine what kind of output shaft you have. So. Every once in a while I'll get something like this. It's real stubborn, but that's actually a good thing. You know that there's really good um, mating integrity here. So you just want to be careful. So here's your bearing on the back side of the ring gear journal. So it's like so. Just like that. So you got your top hat race, note the position. These bearings are usually in good shape, but if you have to replace them, any uh, transmission part supplier, uh, you know, local to you, will have, you know, uh, probably a whole box full of these things. So don't worry if uh, yours are somehow damaged. So what you're now gonna do is you're gonna take the rest of this and just push it through the back. And now your output carrier is free and you have your um, ring gear and your intermediate shaft. And then you have your third bearing assembly. So these are, I guess, Torrington bearings. Uh, they could be called axial bearings. You know, I'll admit, I'm not super up on the exact terminology, but that's how it goes. 480Es, they introduced a spacer in very later model units because they changed the um, height of the planets. So uh, this is your snap ring. It'll secure the uh, ring gear to the intermediate shaft. Um, you could take it off or you can just leave it there. Uh, main thing is, and I know I'm always <laughs> putting it away before I finish. Main thing is you want to again check journal surfaces. Make sure that you don't have any problems. Um, this looks a little scored and actually you can feel a little bit, just very, very little, but it's, it's, it's there. I mean, I could feel it. Sandpaper. I mean, sandpaper solves so many problems. Same thing with the journals here and here for the uh, sun gear shaft bushings. Um, smooth them out. Sometimes these will be out of round and that will be driving why your bushings are getting stuck and not able to slide over them nice and easy. So if that's the case, again, same deal, sandpaper. Um, you know, if you have a real big drill or something or a lathe, you can chuck it up in the uh, jaws of the lathe and then sand it. If not, just do it by hand. I mean, no big deal. Or just hone out your bushings. I mean, the lathe solution is a little bit better because you can probably get it back to round, but it's not super critical and it's not something you lose sleep over. Okay, same deal with the rear planet. You want to check. Okay, you just got to get your fingers in there. If you have real fat fingers, it could be difficult. Mine barely fit and mine are about average sized. But you can usually get in there kind of diagonal. Um, check here too. You want to make sure there's no bluing, no heat, no signs that these pinions are loose. Uh, sometimes that will happen when, you know, a vehicle overheats or it's, you know, real um, heavy duty towing a heavy load or, you know, a box truck or something. 
and it's not well maintained. Uh, this vehicle looks like it was actually in decent shape. The fluid itself looked okay for something that's been sitting in the yard for the last thousand years. So no water was in there. I don't see any signs of contamination from coolant or any of that kind of thing. Uh, that's good news. Um, gear teeth, check them. Check the lugs. We saw that you know we had good uh, you know good mating integrity between the uh, output shaft and the uh, lugs or splines here on the carrier. Make sure these splines are in good shape or lugs rather. And same with the uh, same with the teeth on the ring gear. All right. Check the sun gear, splines, gear teeth. You know, surface both for your bearings. Okay, um, you'll notice you'll have a side where the splines go all the way up to the top, and then the other side the splines are beveled. Uh, these splines, uh, the side where the splines go all the way to the top faces up. All right. Lastly, output shaft. Okay, you're gonna have your gear for both your governor and your speedo. Want to make sure that neither of them are messed up in any way. You can pull the speedo gear off with like a special puller. It's no big deal. In most cases, especially if it's a stock application, you will not need to do that. If it's aftermarket, you may have to. Um, you know, if it's like a resto mod or you're doing something different. Uh, journal, again, same deal. And then check this area in here. Make sure it's okay. Make sure there's no damage. Um, you want to, when you're replacing this bushing and you, you know, replace all the bushings, you want to make sure that you install it to the same depth because there's some lube holes below the bushing. I don't know if I can, yeah, you should be able to see that. Uh, you don't want to block off those lube holes because if you do, then obviously you'll have uh, overheating in the back of the case there. All right, let me check the battery and then we'll resume with the uh, drums and then we'll finish off with the pump. All right, real quick with the low reverse band, just want to touch on something. Uh, this is considered a hard part by many builders. In other words, if the band's in good shape and you look at the uh, amount of lining on it, you know, the, uh, the depth of friction material left, if it still looks like it's serviceable, then most builders will actually reinstall this, or at least a lot will. Um, now, you know, I'm not up on exactly the practices on everybody, but uh, I know that years ago it was, you know, considered a hard part to... Uh, you know to replace the band if you wanted it replaced and you would pay extra uh, in my builds I just replace them. I don't even bother um, <clears throat> They're not that expensive 35 or 40 bucks and you have a brand new band You don't have to worry about it. And if you're doing anything high performance always replace it uh, Fretting rings are usually no big deal. I mean this one's kind of I don't know Kind of misshapen a little bit. You can bend it back um, Your center support snap rings again, no big deal we touch on the frictions. I will say for the TH400 and the 4L80E high energy board Warner frictions will accommodate 99% of applications. You don't really need anything beyond that. Um, you know, you're doing something real super wild and crazy. Maybe you want to put like Raybestos Blues in a direct drum, that's fine. But um, in most cases, you're not going to need to. Um, you know, like I mentioned before, higher performance, heavier duty bands for the intermediate are also available. And then uh, I didn't touch on it initially, but um, if you want to run a Chrysler 48, 47, 46 RERH direct clutch drum snap ring for the direct clutch pack, um, that's perfectly fine. I do that all the time. Uh, I want to say the thicknesses are somewhere, um, there's two thicknesses primarily that I'll use. It's going to either be, I want to say 89 thousandths, 89, 88 thousandths, or 100 five to 110 thousandths depending on where my uh, clearance ends up so um if you don't want to spend money on like transgos kits uh you know because they all come with them just purchase an a518 8618 snap ring for the direct clutch drum and you'll be good to go just you may have to purchase two of them and spend like you know six or seven bucks instead of three or four just to make sure you get um at least one that'll get you into the clearance range you need to be and we talked about dual feeding, so speaking of the direct clutch, we can kind of wrap up that conversation here, at least in so far as what to do in the direct clutch when it comes to internally dual feeding it. Um, as you guys know, I am not generally a fan of dual feeding by way of shift kits uh, for these or any other transmission. 
Uh, if you're gonna have a transmission on the bench, it makes no sense not to just do it internally and save yourself the 50 to 100 bucks you're gonna spend on a shift kit that dual feeds through a plate. All right, let's see what we got in here. Okay, as, as I was mentioning earlier, some of these uh, very heavy duty units or high performance uh, TH-475s, 400s will have six clutches in the uh, direct drum. So we'll talk about how they manage to stick all these clutches in there in a second, but let's take a quick look and see what they look like in terms of conditioning. Uh, steel's look in good shape. Friction also look good. So this one is not going to take a cushion plate. All right, pressure plate <clears throat> or, or apply plate. A couple slip marks, no big deal. Um, Grinder with a wafer pad, we'll clean that all right up for you. All right, so what you have here is a um, cast piston, it's cast steel, and then you have uh, what's called a, um, what's called an apply ring, okay? You have the apply ring, and all these apply rings are of different heights. So you have multiple different heights of apply rings, and I'll annotate the video with a chart that you know, tells you uh, how to identify and, you know, which ones correspond to, you know, which height and how tall. But bottom line is um, you can mix and match all of these different uh, apply rings using the uh, cast steel piston and make yourself a, uh, you know, four, five, six clutch stack up direct drum. So if we're doing a race application, let's just say, and we want maximum uh, clamping force in third gear, we would set up something like this with a six clutch stack up just like this you know high energy that's really all you need uh, we will dual feed it and we will drill a bleed hole for um you know exhaust at um, high rpm when the transmission is shifting from one to two so that we don't have centrifugal applying we will combine all that with high rate return springs here in the assembly let me get the uh, snap ring out and then we'll pull the piston now and we can take a look at it Okay, so here we have all of the uh, springs installed except for the 6 and the 12 o'clock position. Yeah, here's our snap ring. Um, you may see a few different configurations like this. So whatever you have, if you're just going back together with it stock, um, just return it exactly how it was and you'll be fine. Okay, so here's your piston, and then this is your apply ring, so it just comes out like that. So these have an identifier. Okay, that's your identifier there. Uh, this is zero, so obviously this corresponds to a six clutch stack. So again, there's no harm in using these pistons. Um, just know that you don't have any kind of lead hole on them. So. You want to make sure that you're venting appropriately and you want to make sure there's at least one bleeder ball in the uh, drum itself. So when it comes to the dual feed, okay, we talked about leaving the seal off the center support there, the second from the top, and then we're going to take this seal off and leave it off. I'm not going to actually take it off now, but uh, you would leave this seal out of the drum. You would not reinstall the one that comes in the kit. Okay, that'll open up this entire underside of this piston for full apply fluid in third gear and give you, um, I want to say it's something like 200% um, more applied surface area than you would have if you didn't do this mod. Uh, why GM didn't dual feed the direct clutch in these transmissions and the, the 350s and the 204Rs, etc., 4L80s from the factory, I do not know, but uh, it's something that you definitely want to do. Uh, especially if you're going to do any high performance or heavy duty towing hauling. 
So let me get a snap ring up, a pair of snap ring pliers, and we'll take that off and look at the sprag. Okay, um, incidentally, there are um, aluminum pistons as well, and they are of different heights. So again, the height kind of regulates or determines how many frictions you can get in that drum. So I'll post, uh, you know, <clears throat> a chart that shows the heights of the aluminum and the different uh, ply, um, apply rings for the stamped steel. So you can look for those if you need a particular one. All right, so in this drum, we have a smooth inner race, which is good news. So this will take a 4L80E, 34 element heavy duty dog bone sprag. The um, TH400s after uh, at some point in the mid 70s, Again, I'll annotate. I want to say actually maybe early 70s, 70, 70, 71. Uh, they went to a roller clutch style one-way uh, deal here, and they had a cam, and I believe there was eight rollers. Um, I mean, they're okay. Again, factory stock, grocery getting. It's not gonna, you know, it's not gonna fail on you to be fine. But anything high performance, you want something like this. Um, the easiest thing to do if your TH400 that you're working with doesn't have a smooth inner race. Uh, just like what you see here, is just go get a 480 e 97 and up direct drum. It'll have all that plus the sprag and you'll be good to go. You can just drop it in. No mods, no nothing. Just, you know, you're done. Um, and then set up the clutch pack however you want. Five frictions and steel is usually sufficient. All right, you would never reuse your um, one-way assemblies. You always replace them. So in this transmission, you have your little roller clutch and your intermediate sprag, you would put new ones in. Pretty simple. So obviously check your race surface. It needs to be nice and smooth. No scoring, no galling, no signs of heat damage. Uh, check the ceiling ring area in here for the um, center support stator. Make sure that there's no uh, grooves cut in. If there is, obviously just replace the drum. It would suck if it was a drum like this because you know you gotta go find another one or you gotta buy a 4080. Um, you know, again, if you're doing anything high performance. Make sure the splines are in good shape. Okay, you don't want to have any problems there. And then for real high RPM, you're going to drill a bleed hole from anywhere from 50 to 65 thousandths, depending on you know what kind of RPMs it's really going to see and how often. Full race application is going to be the you know on the larger side of that uh, range. And then for your outer race. Okay, unlike the TH350s, you don't have to go out and buy a heavy duty, you know, super uh, high performance outer race. The factory one's usually fine up to certain extents. You just need to go through and maybe with a little sandpaper, 400 grit or emery cloth and reestablish your cross hatching. That's really all you need to do with these and then check your, um, your splines, make sure they're not excessively worn. So I didn't go over sprag rotation, but it's, uh, you know, it's just like the 480, you know, clockwise freewheel and locks counterclockwise. And that's because the drum faces up or forward where the, you know, the clutch basket faces forward. If it faced upside down or rearward like this, it would freewheel counterclockwise and lock clockwise. You know, Ford transmissions are like that. All right. Trying to get organized here on the bench. Okay, forward drum. You're gonna have your little uh, plastic thrust washer here, and then there's gonna be a bronze one on the inside. This is your forward hub. Um, with the TH400s, if there's like one weak link in these transmissions, it's gonna be this forward hub. Um, it's a pot metal cast piece that does like to break. And you know, I'm really struggling with uh, thrust washers today, but. <clears throat> it does like to break, so real high RPM, high performance, just get a billet rollerized piece in here. Sonics makes them, um, you know, several others have them. CK Performance uh, has them available on the website. You know, you can buy them there, you know, eBay or wherever you get your hard parts. So, uh, clearance in the direct clutch, by the way, is between 50 and 60 thousandths, and clearance here is in that same general neighborhood, you can run these down to like maybe 30 and it's, you know, it should be fine. Um, you know, any, any tighter than that, you'd wanna, um, you wanna open up a little bit. So top friction, your apply plate, make sure the surface is good, this is perfect. Let's get this out of 
out of the way. If you are going to reuse this hub, just check it over. Make sure that, uh, you know, there's no cracks in it. Make sure that the, the splines in here are okay. Um, and, you, you know, you don't want any issues with this going back together all flawed. Make sure that this surface in here for the thrust washer is not all scored up. Same with this one. I mean, this is mostly common sense stuff. Okay, forward frictions. Let's have a look at them. Okay, this is the pack. So what do we have here? Five frictions, five steels. A wavy plate. They look in excellent shape. This clutch would have worked perfectly fine if it was to uh, be put back in the service. Not that we would ever do that, but um, it's in good shape. Okay, the uh, drum itself, all these drums never change. I mean, you know, they're all the same. So, um, the variable pitch converters had different input shafts. Uh, so if you need to go back and forth between a fixed pitch and a variable, uh, for whatever reason, maybe you need to swap because the parts are bad. Um, just know that the drum itself is fine. Just press this out, press the other one in. Um, check your splines. Um, especially in these heavy duty units, these could be worn. Okay, you see a little bit of wear on these. I mean, it's not totally horrible, but it is worn. And then same deal um, with respect to the uh, pistons, uh, stamped steel in here, and you have um, the apply rings, which you know you can swap in and out to adjust how many uh, frictions you want in your drum. So five frictions in the forward is perfectly fine. I mean, you really don't need to do anything more than that. Um, you know, if you had like four or something, maybe you want to upgrade to five. Even four is usually okay. Uh, these transmissions are incredibly tough and, you know, incredibly durable. And as long as you build everything correct, you don't make any procedural errors and you choose wisely when it comes to parts, you're not going to have a problem. Okay, so you see how the snap ring, it's orientated so that um, all four of these locking bosses are engaged. That's exactly how you want to go back with it. So I'll take this out and then we'll look at the piston. All right, so same deal with the uh, return spring assembly, except in this case, looks like we got all of our return springs. So again, one of those common sense deals, but I'll mention it. Uh, I like to keep all my forward return springs and my direct return springs separate. Um, I don't know that they're any different in terms of their tension, but um, I want to make sure that I keep my counts straight. Uh, granted, if you're you know, filming or you're taking pictures, you won't have a problem remembering what goes where because you have pictures. Okay. So, same deal. You have a, a little bleeder ball. The uh, KS pistons, uh, KS steel, do not typically have those. So you notice here, um, in most TH400s, there is a center lip seal. Um, GM installed these center seals on the forward drums just to kind of abate the uh, flow of fluid into this uh, into this drum and behind the piston to soften the engagement from park or neutral or reverse into drive. Uh, you could leave it out, doesn't matter. You can put it back in. It's really up to you. Um, it's not the end of the world if it's not there. In this case, it's, it's not there. Uh, with these heavy duty units, uh, that was probably by design. You know, you got a 10,000 pound plus vehicle, you know, you want positive engagement. You don't want it slipping in forward, uh, especially if somebody just takes off before the clutch has had a, a chance to fully apply. And that does sometimes happen with, uh, you know, some folks. <clears throat> so check piston, make sure it's not damaged in any way. You know, make sure that uh, none of these little um, uh, spring seats or spring tabs, they're not, you know, cracked at the base. Again, common sense stuff. Nothing you don't already know. For your drum, check your uh, ceiling ring pocket. Make sure that it is good and that there's not going to be problems with the ceiling rings on the stator for the pump. And then your, uh, your bushing journals. You know, if they're kind of like, you know, rough around the edges looking, so to speak, just 
take sandpaper and clean them up, you're not going to have issues. Alright, is there anything else I need to talk about with respect to the forward drum? I don't think so. Um, I guess one thing I'll mention, I can mention this now when I, when I do the pump, um, is you want to be careful when you seat the pump into the case for the final time that you don't cut your ceiling rings, okay? All right, let me go get my uh, little pump stand and then we'll take the pump apart and that'll be it. Okay, front seal, you can take that out whenever. All right, so I will put a chart up on the screen that talks, um, or I should say gives you uh, an interchange key between pump body and pump cover. Uh, there is a, several different combinations that you need to know and you need to know which ones will actually work because about half of them will and half of them won't. So just be aware of that. Um, but the pump, the main concerns with these is high line pressure due to, you know, worn out boost or pressure regulator valves. Uh, you also have concerns about volume and, um, you know, pressure sustainment at high RPMs if you have a worn crescent. And, um, and then, of course, the working surfaces. You have to make sure that the working surfaces are within spec. In other words, they're flush, true, and perfectly flat, at least in the case of the pump cover and the body and the deck surface and then your clearance between your, you know, your two gears and your pump body working surface have to be within spec as well. All right, so half inch on these and then just take note of where each respective bolt goes. Um, this is the longest bolt and it comes out of this location right next to the boost valve. And then you got another bolt that's a little bit shorter. You got these two bolts here, okay, here and here, they're the same length. And then you got these two bolts, they're the same length. So this is the long bolt. These two bolts are the same length. They're slightly shorter than the long bolt. And then you have these two bolts are the shortest. That's the bolt location, not here. All right, <clears throat> bushings, always replace them. Uh, worn bushings can lead to issues as well. So. You want to make sure you replace your bushings in these things. All right, this working surface looks good, but you want to check it with a straight edge to be sure. Um, the standard is really a half a thou. Uh, if you're more than a half a thou out, you just chuck it up on a lathe and you, you know, make it flat again. No big deal. Check your splines here, make sure they're in good shape. Okay, um, it's very rare I see these bad, but you know, the one time that I'll not check, thinking it's fine, and it'll be no good, and of course it'll come back to haunt me or bite me. Uh, let me get some snap ring pliers and we'll disassemble the um, boost valve and pressure regulator valve. Okay, these are under a considerable tension. I may or may not actually be able to get the snap ring out just sitting here on the bench, we'll see. What I typically do with these is chuck this whole thing up into a vise, and that's how I take it out. So we'll see if I can get it out just sitting on the bench. Okay, an overwhelming majority of your applications or whatever it is you're doing, the factory spring is going to be fine. Okay, you're not going to need to upgrade this to something, you know, higher tension or more powerful or whatever. Um, what I will typically do is run the Sonex uh, Line Boost TH400, and I just put that in backwards, and um, I will reuse the factory spring. Okay. 
Now, if you are doing something really high performance or really heavy duty, or you just need, you know, uh, that much more line pressure available to you at all times, then you'll want to upgrade the spring. But even then, I mean, you know, Sonics makes one, I think it's 10% more than factory on a linear basis uh, in terms of line pressure that it'll give you. You know, that, that should meet pretty much all conceivable needs. I know there's some others, Transgo and, uh, you know, um, I think CK Performance makes a couple available that are really super, you know, high tension, high pressure. Uh, if you're gonna run those, make sure that you do other things inside the case to mitigate um, associated risks of running those high pressure springs. So, um, case saver for the intermediate plus uh, heavy duty snap ring. And then um, in the pump cover, you wanna make sure that you, um, yeah, you restrict your converter charge. I think it's this right here, this, this orifice right here. Um, make sure that you uh, don't let that unattended to in a high pressure situation or converter ballooning will become a real problem. All right. So your PR valve, spring seat, the little horseshoe washer, and then your boost valve. Okay, just like that. And that's how it goes into the pump. So there were two different versions of this PR valve. Um, there was an early and a late, and you wanna make sure that you're not mixing and matching pump covers uh, you know, pump cover housings with the wrong associated PR valve. So, how you can tell is you see how this is squared off like this? All right, if you, you, you have a pump cover housing and it's squared off on this side, you know you're dealing with a uh, later model um, PR valve. <clears throat> And I apologize, it's just real hot here, real dry. I mean, you know, it's end of the summer. Cannot wait till it cools off. But after a while, my voice will get hoarse. Just, you know, it is what it is. So if I'm coming across not entirely understandable, um, you know, apologize. Okay, and then don't forget, oops, don't forget your retainer. Okay, that retainer goes right here in the rear plug. I think Sonics makes a uh, O-ring plug, but in my experience, you really don't need it. I mean, unless there's a wear there. Okay, that's the pump cover. Again, uh, you know, I'll do a separate video on interchange of all the different pump cover and pump body permutations and combinations, but uh, for now, we'll just kind of cover the basics. Um, two different pump gears were installed in these things, an early set, they were narrow gears, I think they were like 625 thousandths, and then you had a later gear set uh, that were between 720 and 724, 725, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, you know, a lot of racers like the early style, uh, the narrow gears, so um, just make sure you're matching your gears and your um, pump bodies. I mean, it'll be obvious, you know, gear will be sitting in there and you'll have like a whole bunch of space between the... Uh, pop top of the gear and the uh, deck surface. I mean, you know, it's not, not exactly something you'll miss um, if you install the wrong gear set. Okay, um, inspect your gears. Make sure that there's no cracking. Make sure that the teeth are in good shape. Make sure that both sides of the teeth are healthy and that the crest is also, um, you know, in good serviceable condition all the way around. Be careful um, around this area here where the torque converter engages the uh, drive gear, okay? Subtle little cracks can appear after a while or just, you know, under abuse, use and wear and tear. So if that's the case, or if there's any doubt in your mind, go ahead and just buy a new gear set. Um, otherwise, you can reuse these gears if you meet clearance or if you uh, have the pump body and the pump cover machined. Okay, if you have the pump body and pump cover machined, make sure that you machine them, or if you're doing it, or if your machinist is doing it, make sure that uh, they have the gears so that they can machine it exactly to spec, and I'll flash the specs on the screen. But same principle as all the other transmissions. I mean, any transmission that has a pump like this, or any kind of pump at all, vein style, gear style, gear rater style, it's all the same principle, same concept. Not, not anything new here. So here's your casting numbers. This is for the body. This is for the cover. 
So you're going to reference these last four. And then with the body, you're going to reference the three digit casting number here. And that's how you're going to determine if you have a pump body and pump cover combination that will work. Okay, uh, so that's the TH-475 Turbo Hydromatic 475, bigger brother of the TH-400 in terms of torque handling capacity and strength. Uh, these are not all that common. Um, one other uh, thing I will mention, um, this ties all the way back to the beginning where I was discussing how to identify one of these things. Um, you will come across TH-400 cases that have the letters HD stamped into the bell housing. Okay, uh, you will come across that. Um, and don't get me wrong, those are excellent cores for a heavy duty or high performance build. So if you do come across one and you can't find a 475, buy that core if it's reasonably priced because it's a good core. But it is not a TH-475. None of the TH-475s were stamped HD to my knowledge. Okay, so if you're you know not sure, um, either print out or have handy the link to my um, ID tag reference sheet for the TH-400. It's in the description of this video. And you can quickly cross-reference what you see out there in Junkyard or Salvage Yard or Craigslist or wherever against that list. And you can be sure of what you're buying and or you know what you maybe want to pass on. So um, as always, if you have any questions, comments, go ahead and leave them below. I'm sure there's about a you know, million and one things I left out. Uh, I'll do topical videos on things like the modulator system, the detent system, uh, governors, uh, valve bodies. Uh, I have some teardown inspection and uh, reassembly on the valve body. One thing I'll mention on the valve body before I close, in case you don't watch those videos, the detent and detent regulator valves specifically. If you don't have to take them out, just leave them in. Check them with your you know, little flat blade screwdriver, make sure they're moving freely. But unless uh, you had problems with downshifting in your TH400 or 475 or whatever, or if you're doing this for somebody else, if they, you know, unless they tell you that they had that kind of problem, um, you know, assume it's fine. You know, replace um, the detent solenoid, but leave those valves alone. And the reason I say this is because the, the inboard valve loves to come out, but it hates going back in and it will fight you. Uh, I would say 50% of the time, you're gonna have a problem getting that stupid valve back in. And one case I had to do very, very risky, somewhat invasive surgery with a drill bit to open up the you know entrance to that inboard uh, valve's bore so that it'll go back in there because it was slightly out of round. So just be aware of that. Um, you know, uh, that applies to some Ford uh, valve bodies as well, C6, C4s. You know, there's some valves that just, you know, you don't want to take them out unless you have to. Um, you know, I think the TH350 for the most part is okay. The 700R4 is fine, and, you know, the more modern transmissions are fine. But the D10 regulator and uh, D10 valves, just leave them in their respective bores. You can wash them in the jet wash or in the uh, parts, you know, solvent tank thing or whatever you have if you're using kerosene or if you're using brake cleaner, it really doesn't matter. They'll be, they'll be fine. Just spray them down with WD-40 when you're done. All right. Um, thanks again for watching. Appreciate it. Um, enjoy the rest of your day or evening. If you want something specific covered in a video, just go ahead and put it in the comments, and I will get to it as soon as I can.